Kaiser Show. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me for this episode is Chris Wynn, the founder and CEO of Advisor Assist, and we are going to talk about some new initiatives that have come out from the SEC and what implications they could have for your business. Our mission at Resilient Advisor is to have a significant impact on the retirement crisis by educating and empowering financial advisors to better serve their clients. We bring you industry thought leaders and experts to help you make a difference in the lives of your clients. Are you struggling to hold your team accountable? Do you struggle getting them to see your vision and drive results? The resilient OKR system for financial advisors could be your solution. OKR is an acronym for objectives, which are your big inspirational goals and key results which are how you and your team are held accountable. This is the Silicon Valley method that drives growth at major companies such as Intel, Google, BMW, and Disney. Move your business results away from opinions and measure it with data. Pick up your complimentary access to the Resilient OKR system for financial advisors by visiting resilientadvisor.com slash OKR. Chris Wynn has become a regular guest on the Resilient Advisor Show. And in fact, our last broadcast on the updates from the SEC as it relates to the marketing rule was one of our most watched episodes because, Chris, you really come with some great information and guidance for advisors on these important topics. I received an email from you at the beginning of the month laying out some initiatives that the SEC will be looking at this year. And I appreciate you coming on to talk these through with advisors. Before we get started, could you give us some context for why they send this out, how regular this happens, and what advisors should be looking for? Excellent, Jay. Thank you for having me again. Uh, so the SEC uh, you know, has a really tough job. Uh, the number of registered investment advisors cr- increases significantly on a rolling basis, and they have their limited resources to get out and review and examine all the different firms. Uh, a number of years ago, they realized that they were getting uh, – killed in quoting percentages. So the, they used to quote in how many percentages, the percentage of exams that they would get out to and review. Of course, with an increasing denominator, that makes your numerator look smaller, right? So the, the challenge that they had is how do we make this more of a risk-based approach and how do we get the industry as a whole to help us be more efficient in doing our jobs as, as regulators, their jobs as a regulator. So they started by, uh, you know, creating a number of initiatives in terms of the way they handle exams. But one of them is to is to demystify what they're looking at. So instead of the, you know, the 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 classic, I'm not going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm just going to wait till I I can say I gotcha. They said, why don't we let let everyone get ahead of it and start to understand? Here's where we see the risk. And as fiduciaries, which most registered investment advisors are, complete fiduciaries. Here are the things you need to be thinking of. So generally each year, um, around the start of every year, they uh, they release their priorities, uh, the SEC's priorities for their examinations, where they're going to spend their time um, in helping the advisors to make sure that they're performing their own self-assessments or risk assessments in those particular areas. And this year we're a little late in it given the uh, – kind of uh, being that it was an election year and they, the general character of everything that was going on in Washington. So generally they, they're a little earlier in the year. Usually I'm having this, uh, th- these types of conversations in the January timeframe. Um, but, you know, given the, you know, the timing of when this came out, uh, obviously, um, you know, we're getting, we're all, everybody's getting to it as quickly as possible here. Yep. Yep. And there are 11 priorities that we're going to talk about today. If you're watching this broadcast live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, feel free to chime in if you have any questions, and Chris will answer them to the best of his ability on on a live broadcast. But also, if you're watching this on replay on YouTube, there's a new feature now where I will break this down by chapter for each one of the 11 priorities. Chris, let's dig in. The first one is fiduciary care. Absolutely. So the, the the fiduciary responsibility of a registered investment advisor is nothing new. Um, but what the SEC did uh, to bring it right up to the forefront is 
kind of reinformed the, the, the advisors as a whole as to what does fiduciary duty really mean? And in true SEC form is if you can't prove it, we're going to assume it didn't really happen. And so let's, let's dig into it. Uh, Section 206 of the Advisors Act defines the fiduciary duty and responsibility of an advisor. And it's a term that's used very heavily throughout the industry. Um, but what does it really mean? Um, so it's great. You know, we can throw it out our website saying we're a fiduciary. We put you first. Well, what's what's from a practical standpoint, how do you, in fact, put people first? What is the what are the things that you do as a fiduciary in your day to day management of client assets, your uh, your your decisions that you make with clients, the other supporting business activities you have to avoid any conflicts of interest? So it's really the key that what they're looking for is to avoid the conflicts of interest and, of course, have a way of mitigating, um, you know, any you know, if there is any conflict, what are you doing about it? We, we could do a whole episode on fiduciary duty and fiduciary care. Clearly, it's a priority that they're looking at this year in the examination process. The, the second item is form CRS, which if this is a surprise to you, you need a new compliance consultant. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so form CRS is the client relationship summary. And the SEC made a, a requirement for the CRS to be provided to clients at the start of a relationship but also to be included with the uh, the advisor's website if they have one. And the CRS is uh, intended to really define what the relationship looks like with the client, any major conflicts, how, how does an advisor charge for their services, uh, and generally what to expect. And one, one other thing that's you know, unique about it is if any person in the firm has anything disclosable on their uh, at the firm level or in their U4, it requires a, a, you know, it's a yes or no answer with no explanation. It drives you to the site. And what they're trying to get people to do is to go do due diligence on the advisor at investor.gov. So the is SEC website. That could create a challenge for some of these aggregators that might have some IARs with some dings on their U4, wouldn't you think? Well, without a doubt. And, and unfortunately, that whole system itself needs some repair. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of things that are, that, that are on U4s that shouldn't be out there. Uh, and sometimes it's tough to see the, you know, the items that are actually issues in a, in a sea of, you know, you know, potential items. So is a client complaint really necessarily mean an advisor did something wrong? No. If the advisor has, you know, four, five, six, seven of them, can you look at it and say, well, we got a trend? Perhaps. Like it's it, so it's it's tough. But with, um, you know, with uh, certain, you know, states and others where you see billboards out there saying, you know, if you've lost ever, ever lost any money in the markets, give us a call and we'll well, you know, come shake down your advisor for you. It's, you know, it's, it's a broken system. And so there's reporting out there that's unfair. Um, but if you look at it from the other side, uh, the regulators say obscuring the information isn't fair either. So that's why they, they're, they're saying, you know, yes, no answer. And then let the, the tool that's designed for the disclosure speak for itself and, uh, and, and bring it to that level. Another priority that they rolled out this year is around conflicts of interest. What, what are they looking for? Well, you know, it, it ties right into your fiduciary duty, but the conflicts of interest can be uh, are, are ranging the, the, the scope of an advisory practice. So, for instance, even a firm that, you know, for instance, does financial planning and at the end of the plan recommends that they continue to work with the advisor, arguably it's a conflict of interest, but of course, no advisor is going to do a financial plan and say, you shouldn't come work with me. You should go somewhere else, uh, which was the whole nature of why they were doing it. Um, but conflicts take on many forms. It's do you have uh, do you have affiliates or relationships? Very common is are you also a hybrid, a registered representative of someone's broker dealer or do you have your own broker dealer? Do you sell and offer insurance? Do you sell and do you offer uh, you know, tax and accounting services or sell mortgages, uh, you know, all of those things are potential conflicts of interest. Uh, and even one I was dealing with earlier today, uh, someone who's fully employed elsewhere, but trying to create an advisory business for the for the future, 
well, technically there's a conflict of your time. So when are you actually available to be my advisor if you if you have another career? Uh, so there's a number of ways of looking at that of, of looking at that, and the regulators want to make sure that conflicts are fully disclosed. So you know, is there you know, are you investing in the uh, an investment strategy for which you are a you know have a an ownership interest or another financial interest, or are you referring business to someone who has a uh, you know, you have vested interest in the, in the success of the other firm. All those types of items, you know, represent a conflict, a potential conflict of interest. And the regulators want to make sure that we're actually disclosing those. So, Chris, another priority that they issued, I feel like has been on their list for a while, and that's around advisory fee billing. Are there any changes to what they're looking for this year? Well, yes. Well, in terms of it's not so much that they're looking for anything different. It's that, that they found um, in their examinations that uh, a lot of people, a lot of firms weren't as tight with the rules as they were expecting. Uh, so the rules haven't changed. And, and a very common thing, for instance, is a client that uh, terminates uh, within a billing period. And did the firm properly calculate a refund due to the client, timely process that refund, and actually get the money back to the client. Um, and they cited m many instances where uh, it was um, it was inconsistent. So firms would sometimes do it, but sometimes forget. Um, the calculation was not always accurate. Uh, so what, what, when, when is the effective date of termination? Um, and having tracking and methodology uh, around all those components. So that was one of the biggest things. Uh, the other, the other major thing, which could potentially happen to any firm, is the actual calculation methodology itself. Uh, so many firms are, are are leveraging either the custodian or pricing vendor to obtain their pricing, and uh, you know of the individual of the securities in the portfolio, and then they may be either calculating themselves or using a software. Um, and I won't use any anyone's names or any of this. Uh, but if the software, for instance, isn't set up to appropriately calculate the fee, then obviously the fee isn't going to come out right. Um, if there's a contractual breakpoint in the fee, and the and the advisor didn't set up the system to hit the breakpoint when the advisor's uh, the client account hit a million, or the aggregation of all of their accounts to meet the breakpoint, those types of things can result in a misbilling of the of the client assets. And even the application of things um, that would seem simple, such as accrued interest, uh, you know, does a billing period end on a Friday or a weekend, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, the middle of a week. So those types of things of what's in, what's out of the math is of, of, of importance. And what they found from examinations is that as an industry, you know, there's been a lot of gaps. So not everybody is, uh, is as tight as they should be on that. Yeah, I mean, it's very complex going out and calculating that, more or less keeping track of it and running your advisory business, which is a real risk for advisors doing this on their own. Absolutely. And, and we have a testing service that we, we do, but also to help do sample testing on it, but also teach our advisors on how to recalculate and do sample testing. So part of it is um, it's not so much uh, perfection is great, but having a process that sets you up for the ability to, you know, to capture potential deviations is mostly what they're looking for. So it's, uh, you, you know, so if, if you just, if you don't do it, then we know what the answer is. Well, you can't possibly know if you've ever miscalculated a fee if you've never looked. Right. <laughs> right. Well, let's use that as a segue here. We have a handful of priorities left to still go over, but would you tell listeners and viewers a little bit about advisor assist and the services that you guys offer? Certainly. Uh, so Advisor Assist helps advisors in two real distinct phases of their life cycle. On the initial startup of a firm or someone who's contemplating creating a registered investment advisor, we help them with the strategic design, build, and transition into their RIA. So essentially helping them from concept to live, helping them extract themselves from their current situation in a safe manner and properly get up and running to help the that you know, help transition all of their clients over into their new registered investment advisor. Then once they're up and running, uh, we have a, a, a suite of services that we help them in what we call risk management. Uh, and the, and 
instead of just considering compliance, you know, we look at it in the broader sense of compliance is one leg of the stool. We need to look at not only the regulatory environment, but the external threats like cybersecurity, uh, the, uh, you know, the processes and workflows and the use of your technology to help create a risk managed business. So regulators are just one component of all of that there. So with that, we have structured compliance programs to essentially guide them through their year in compliance. And depending on the, the size and complexity of the firm and the resources that they have, we can either do things alongside the, the, the firm or we can do it for them. Uh, so as I mentioned moments ago, we, we have our core compliance, but where we're administering the compliance program and keeping all the policies and procedures up to date and ADVs filed. But we can also uh, take some of the burden off of the CCO to dive in and do the actual testing. So the fee billing that we just described is a service where advisor assists can actually go gather all the data, uh, have read-only access into the systems and do all those you know, calculations and validations for them as well. And, and really the goal is to keep them as uh, you know, audit ready as possible. And we have a technology we built called Advisor Cloud that not only helps us collaborate with everything, but it uh, essentially gives us the audit trail. So when the audit does come, we can we have the uh, a, a full uh, a full feed of everything that's been done to help the advisor and what they've been doing on their own to prepare for compliance. Excellent. You know, Chris and I have a lot of joint clients. I've been on that system before. It it helps an advisor manage their compliance process. But I'm telling you, if you're listening to this because you're considering a breakaway from your wirehouse or your broker dealer and in going independent, I find that most advisors are getting their information from either custodians or recruiters, even worse, recruiters at aggregators. And that is not the best place to start. Whenever I have somebody reach out and they're ready to do a break, I'm not a recruiter. And I start with Chris Wynn and his team, and they set the table for what they need to think about as you go through the breakaway process. And Chris, you and your team do an excellent job of that. Oh, thank you very much, Jay. All right. So the next priority we should talk about is the appropriateness of investment advice. What are they looking for this year? Well, again, this is not a new topic, but I want one where uh, if, if we tie it back to fiduciary duty, you know, uh, saying you're fiduciary and then having something to prove and demonstrate it are two completely different things in the eyes of the regulators. So with the appropriateness of investment advice, they're, they're looking at um, you know, gaining a full understanding of the client and their situation and making sure that your investment advice is either tailored to the client or you are only managing the portion for which is fitting of your strategy. So the SEC is mandating that uh, the firm conform their strategies always to a client. Um, but for instance, if you don't have a small cap strategy and your strategy is run the same way for everybody, well, perhaps 100% of one's assets shouldn't be in that strategy. Um, if you're a wealth advisor and you are crafting an overall portfolio for them, they're looking for, well, what is the due diligence that you are performing, initial and ongoing, to determine not only what, you know, where the client's, uh, you know, suitability, and, you know, their risk, risk tolerance, time horizon, uh, fit, tax situation, et cetera, all tie into the investments. So really just making sure that all that advice is, is aligning with the, the client situation. And quite frankly, that, that they're looking for proof that, you're, that the advisors are continuing to earn their fee. So uh, a really good analysis on the front end to craft a portfolio, and then just looking at it once a year, the regulators would say, well, you don't meet the definition of assets under management. It's, it's neither regular nor continuous if you're only looking at something once a year. So it's kind of bringing all these concepts together and they're just, uh, you know, uh, trying to find a way to bring this to the top so that everyone understands it's a focus area. Yeah, I've run into that situation with wirehouse advisors going independent and they've been able to sit in those portfolios that they set it and forget it. And then they go to the independent space and meeting that requirement is, is a new challenge for them. Is that something common or just what I've run across in my work? Well, you know, it's fairly common. Um, it's it's it is a little bit more common from those that are coming out of a uh, a wirehouse environment where the, they were in uh, advisory programs where someone else was the 
portfolio manager for the program and the advisory person was handling other complementary advice components. So financial planning and, you know, which programs to be on, which managers to utilize in a program, but not so much the specific security recommendations. Um, you know, the SEC was intentionally broad here in that they're not trying to craft people's portfolio, advisors' portfolios for them. They're not trying to tell them that you can't use alternative investments. They're not trying to tell them you can't use options. They're not saying that you have to use direct investments and can't use independent managers. What they're saying is that it needs to be appropriate for the client, the situation, and that has everything to do with, you know, asset size, time horizon, risk, um, you know, what you're going to do, the effort you're putting in as an advisor versus what you're delegating out to, to third parties. And really the key thing is it's a shift. So for instance, take whether all or a portion of a client's account gets allocated out to investment managers, other advisors on an investment platform or a direct sub-advisory relationship. Those things are still okay. It just is a shift in responsibility. So if you're the one that's uh, that that if you're re if, if you're doing internal management and you're the one that's doing the specific trading and security selection, you have a different set of activities than if you're supervising somebody else that you've delegated that to. And really, the key that they're coming to is to say, just because you've delegated to someone else that's uh, that's supposed to be an expert, you have a responsibility to now due diligence on them to make sure that they're consistent with the investment mandate. Uh, on, a, on a perpetual basis. And does implementing an investment committee take care of this most of the time? Well, it's, it certainly helps, right? Um, it, it, but the, the challenge, of, of course, is um, it, it depends on the size of an advisor. Um, some smaller firms have an investment committee that may include somebody that's external to the firm, whether it's a, a, an advisory board member or one or more members of a platform for which they are receiving research analysis and other other components so it doesn't always need to be you know uh, a, a you know specific named investment team within a firm um, but it it, uh, it shows well uh, the the challenge of course is if you say that you do something you got to actually do it right so having an investment committee is only uh, is only as helpful as having uh, you know consistent uh, review of investments and documentation of committee and committee minutes and meetings along the way. So uh, it, it, you know, the SEC looks not only for the things that you aren't doing, but the things that you say you do, but don't do. So it's, it's, it's a very important thing that you brought up. Yes. Yes. Our mission at Brazilian Advisor is to have a significant impact on the retirement crisis by educating and empowering financial advisors to better serve their clients. In the new Resilient Advisor series, How I Serve, we interview top financial advisors who are making a difference in the lives of their clients. All right. Another priority that they're looking at this year is sustainable investing. What do advisors need to be mindful of? Well, I guess one of the key things that first comes to mind, and it's not core to, um, to ESG specifically, but hypothetical performance is an area that I would first, that immediately first comes to mind in that a lot of uh, anytime there's something that is a, a new trend, um, you know, there's those that are on the forefront of that and, and those that are moving along with the momentum of it. Um, but the challenge is that, that there isn't a lot of, uh, you know, uh, actual um, documented track record or history for a particular firm, especially if they're creating a new, a new investment model. Um, so first is, is full and fair disclosure around all of this. So uh, the so with the, with these um, making sure that the I, I guess making sure that all of the marketing and advertising is truthful, accurate, and doesn't omit, omit any material fact is important. So sending out a fact sheet talking about your track record on your sustainable portfolio. Um, and showing a 10-year track record, but failing to mention that you've been in business for nine weeks is not, um, it, you know, would be a, a basically a violation by omission in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, so those are the things that they're mostly looking for. Um, the the other is is getting into, you know, does the firm get into proxy voting, and what is their advocacy, and how does their, you know, how far does the portfolio extend? So. It, 
it really hits those core advertising principles, in my opinion. Otherwise, it's 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 no different than any other investments. So, is it truthful? Is it accurate? Are you failing to uh, to include all material facts as part of your you know approach and communication? Yeah, those ESG back tests infuriate me because it's easy to go and throw Tesla and Apple in there, and anything looks good when you add that to a portfolio mix. The last couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Another priority that they're looking at, and I have seen this directly impact a lot of my clients in that cybersecurity and business continuity, especially after COVID-19. The attacks are out there. What are they looking for? Well, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, the fraudsters are out there looking for vulnerabilities. And especially think of it this way, you know, the um, is a fraudster going to go head on with a major financial institution like the major custodians of this industry and try the front door or are they going to try to get some help going in the back door and that's exactly what's happening from the phishing attacks and trying to control computers and even think of the with the with all of the uh the pandemic and work working from home um if you're a fraudster are you going to try to go in and find a way into the encrypted secured uh macbook pro or are you going to try to get in the back door of, uh, from uh, from Xbox or one of the other gaming systems to get on a network? Uh, so there's there's a lot of vulnerabilities that are out here. Um, the fact that we're all dispersed and decentralized for the past year uh, adds to it. So we've strongly advocated that our clients reach out to their uh, you know technology firms and get uh, checkups. And um, and in many instances, we've recommended that they go you know. Uh, go get secure, separate secure networks and bifurcate the, you know, the family stuff from uh, and the other devices from, you know, the true business devices if you're going to work from home, which may seem daunting, but it's actually can be a very inexpensive, uh, you know, setup. It's, you know, all you really need to do is just create a, you know, a sub network. And, um, you know, there, there are a number of really good cyber firms that are out there. They're asking the questions. Um, and we know that they're asking the questions because we're indirectly getting the questions from our advisor, our advisor community asking, you know, how much of this is makes sense and is some of it overkill and so forth. And we're helping them distill that down. But the regulators are looking at it from that same uh, perspective. It's, it's both the cybersecurity and the business continuity. How do we ensure that we're not making uh, or doing workarounds that make us more vulnerable because it's too inconvenient to uh, to log into a network of systems, or there's no one monitoring, you know, your home network, you know, except for your children who are looking for the full bandwidth for for Xbox, right? So that's right. That's that's the key thing. And se separately on business continuity, uh, you know, is your is your policy in your workflows are they realistic? Do they work? Did you prove that they worked? So firms, you know, we've always encouraged firms and we assist in help them, helping them do their business continuity testing. But, you know, essentially we've just completed, you know, 375 plus uh, or more days of, of uh, you know, national business continuity testing here, right? Since right. many things started to, to, you know, to close down. Well, did those policies get updated? Were any things that were workarounds, be, did they become part of the standard operating procedure and are there controls in place? Are we, you know, if the folks are using computers off the network, is there something to, 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 to ensure that they're not ending up locally on a laptop and, you know, and that we're not, you know, double doing double duty with the, uh, the business laptop with, uh, you know, kids jumping onto a zoom call for school, right? Those are the things that are, you know, that are really important. And I, th I think the biggest thing here is the SEC is, is more asking than telling. And what I mean by that, they, 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 they want to understand what everybody's going through more than just going out and telling everybody what their expectation is. So they're asking a lot of questions and they're probing questions, which tie into fiduciary duty and, you know, books and records. And, the, you know, so while there isn't a specific rule to reference, the SEC is going back to the fiduciary rule saying, well, wouldn't it be reasonable as a fiduciary that you'd have strong security and cybersecurity controls in place and you have to nod? Well, yes, I guess that would make sense as an advisor. Um, 
as the chief compliance officer of an advisor, you know, subject to rule 20647, you're required to have a compliance program in place to prevent any of these issues. Wouldn't it be reasonable then that you have a cybersecurity policy and that you test it? I'm like, okay, yes, you, you, you've got me there. Okay, great. Well, now show me all the things that you've been doing to adapt your policies and procedures and to do the testing, given that you're in this new environment. And that's where they're finding the weakness there is everyone, we're seeing a lot of advisors saying, well, I have a business continuity plan. It says I can work from anywhere at any time. Okay, well, now you're working from anywhere at any time. Is it, does it need to be evolved? Are you doing things exactly the way you conceive them, you know, when you wrote your policy three years ago? Or is there something that's new and different that you need to be thinking about? And that's, that's what they're getting at. They're really trying to, you know, not just the, hit the nuts and bolts of making sure our customer accounts are safe and that information is, is, is safely and securely in the advisory systems, but just make sure that they're, they're, that if there is an incident, are we going to ignore it because it happened at home instead of happening at the office? Um, you know, is there proper escalation procedures uh, and, you know, all the protocols? So it, it is, uh, we could spend two shows on this one just in and of itself. And quite frankly, this is the biggest risk. So uh, they, they, they put it, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the pack in terms of what they're focusing on. But arguably, this is the biggest risk advisors have out there and, re and, and requires a you know, fair amount of attention. And, you know, Chris, I'd also add to people listening. And if you're still listening 30 minutes into a show on SEC priorities with a compliance expert, you probably already have this covered. But just in case you don't, Check your ENO policy and see if you're covered for cybersecurity attacks. I have seen it create amazing havoc on financial statements for some of these advisors. So uh, check with your ENO broker. That's actually a very great point. And really quickly to add to that is look up how they define negligence. So if you have a cyber event and you continue to listen to the end of this uh, end of this session here, are you now negligent for not stopping what you're doing and going to do to going? to cor take corrective action. So is it time bound? Uh, you know, are there any events that aren't properly disclosed that, you know, insurance companies aren't out here to pay, aren't out here to pay, right? <laughs> They're gonna look for every reason why it should be uh, outside the policy. So you need to make sure that you're, you know, ironclad on those uh, in terms of your internal approaches and make sure your policy is actually working for you. So if you're paying for a policy and no, you can never use it, then it's, it's an automatic loss. Right, right. So, Chris, another priority are automated compliance software systems. What do you know? What they're looking for on that this year? Absolutely. So, um, a lot of the portfolio reporting systems have added a lot of uh, compliance functionality, and p part of the key thing is they're looking for leverage of technology to bring things to an exception-based process. So, recognizing that there's only so many hours in a day. If you're looking at a full universe of, of everything, can you can you find an issue in a sea of trades? Or you know, if you look at every one of your client accounts at once, are you going to find the account that that needs attention? That you know, the, the the firm that needs rebalancing, the account that has high cash or low cash, the one that didn't get traded at the you know and get left out of a block trade. So what they're really looking for is to leverage the the you know the technology that's out there to filter these things so that you have different lenses of, of your view. And from a compliance standpoint, you can look at these and call this all a cost and look at everything after the fact. So go, go back at the end of each quarter and have your compliance consultant or your operations team go and look at all your trades, or you can bake it into your day-to-day -day investment management process and risk oversight. So what reports do you look at as a portfolio manager, you know, an advisor to your clients uh, the technology allows you to just adapt the reports that you're looking looking at and see some of them that are exceptions that meet certain criteria. And by, you know, we think, a, you know, a healthy suite of these reports that are accessible on a regular and, and routine basis to the advisors make them better advisors. So it's not just about, you know, catching the trade error or seeing if a, a client account uh, wasn't traded as quickly as, as possible. But more, you know, looking at opportunities to connect and, and, and talk with the clients or looking at risk across the enterprise, 
uh, and, and truly knowing the client base, knowing the and, and knowing the the universe of investments. So these technologies are coming; they're leaps and bounds better than they have been in years past. And uh, that you know, it's we're seeing advisors uh, really you know get get the most out of them. And again, you know, they're 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 paying uh, well for those systems. This just gives a a mechanism for really getting the most ROI out of that spend. Yeah, and, and I don't want to name any names, but I've been sitting in on some demos recently, and they kind of let me look behind at some of the beta things they're doing, and it is pretty cool the the type of reporting they can give you or will be able to give you in the very near future. Absolutely. So, so another priority is around digital assets. It's a hot topic. Yes. Well, you know this this is a extremely hot topic. We could spend a month on this one. Uh, the, the challenge with a lot of the digital assets that are out there really stem in the you know the journaling and the risk controls and uh, you know who who is policing who in in, in what regard. Um, you know, the, so the it's it's all evolving at a very rapid pace. Uh, but the the various market participants that that are that are, that are here, you know. No one wants to be left behind, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of risks. So, you know, first going back to your E and O, you know, are you even covered if there was ever a mistake with uh, with digital assets? Um, how do you report on it? How do we know that if we're, you know, going back to the prior topic of of automated, um, you know, compliance systems? How do we know? Uh, how do we get the the real time data or near real time data? on all this information to know that it's fitting and tying into the suitability of a client portfolio. Uh, so there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, how do we trust the pricing? Is there any, you know, so who is, you know, where, where is the authoritative pricing source and is the authoritative pricing source, you know, legitimate in and of itself? So it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's a fascinating area, and, but the, you know, the challenge is that there isn't a, you know, a single ownership of it. And so that that's what makes it, you know, a bit of a challenge where, you know, you know, if you have a, for instance, we'll take something very simple. You have an open end 40 act mutual fund that prices at the end of the day, you know, the price at the end of the day is the price at the end of the day. And every, and it's the same for everybody. Um, and that is, you know, that's all long since been baked into processes and controls with, with all these digital assets, you know, is it, it, you know, when does it actually close? What's the timing? You know, uh, when do you value it? Uh, so if you're billing a client um, and you, you know, went to go get a cup of coffee at, uh, you know, at month end, uh, when you came back, the price was materially different. What do you, what, what price do you use mm -hmm. to build a client for your services? So there's just all these unknowns that are out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we continue to, you know, track it and, in great detail because not only is, is, is there a great demand to understand it, but it, it, it's, you know, the, it's just, there's just so it takes all of the rest of the issues or topics of the industry and rolls them all into this one, one, one topic. Cause it's almost like starting over in this, in this new, in this new reality and trying to figure out how all the other controls tie into this. And when you dig deeper, and I've had a lot of folks that are experts in the digital asset space on the show, and really I brought them on for my own educational experience. Yeah. Boy, they're smart people building really incredible platforms in this kind of wild west component. But man, we could wake up one day, and if we're not paying attention, this is a big part of our industry. And you know, there are folks that aren't going to want to get left behind. But I have a feeling that people are going to get hurt in the process by not following the rules. And I know advisors are giving advice on it when they should not be. And the education that's needed for what they can and cannot say and can and cannot do has never been more important. Without a doubt, yeah. And and that's that's why again tying it back to fiduciary duty and suitability. If your client is, you know, for instance, Miss, Mrs. Smith as a 75 year old widow, and you're having this conversation about digital assets, it's probably something wrong. However, that does, isn't universal, right? So it could be, uh, you know, it could be the, the wealth of Mrs. Smith and she could be trying to generate substantial wealth for her grandchildren. So it's all, it's all these things where all these factors have to come together with a fact pattern to determine, you know, not only what's right or wrong, um, but, uh, you know, but also how do you manage and mitigate the risk uh, of, of any decision? You know what, Chris, this will make a great clip. 
So here's a hypothetical situation. You're a fiduciary advisor and an independent RIA. You're doing your annual review and the client says, oh, by the way, I've got, you know, one and a half million in crypto over in Coinbase. You now know that information. Does it need to be included in their plan? Do you account for it in their in the uh, financial planning software? Do you talk about it at all? What What's the approach? Well, I think the approach will vastly different on, on the client, their situation, and what the, the intent is for doing this. So for instance, some advisors have clients that say, you know, here's all my wealth, but by the way, here's the the uh, carve out of my assets that I, you know, I, I, I like playing around with the markets and I'm going to always do that. And so from an advisor standpoint, we we like to have the client agreements have a, a carve out of, you know, non-managed, non-monitored assets. So you're not picking up liability for things that you can't control, but arguably you can't really do your job if you don't factor everything into it. Right. So it either needs to be like specifically excluded or worked around, but the, the, extent of which the advisor is involved with it needs to be somewhat documented because think of it this way you're you know one's a professional advisor and if something is to go wrong um you know the 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 simple response would be well i mean i just assume my advisor was paying attention to this it's yes professional advisor like why i I told him about it (laughs) right why why isn't he yeah right Exactly. So it's if if there's something where you where the advisor can't take the risk or is you know and and doesn't feel comfortable uh, you know with that asset, we strongly recommend either an investment policy statement, a carve out in the client agreement, um, or even just an email documenting. You know, look on, on March 23rd, we had this conversation about you know about digital assets, and you know we feel that this is a risk area. You you acknowledged my concern and said, "Great, I'm still going to do it. That's okay. You know, the, you know, mm-hmm. your the advisor can't necessarily stop the client from doing the things that they that that, that the client has the will to do, uh, but they can't carry unlimited risk on things either." But you know what, Chris? Like we know advisors, and so even ones that are operating at the at mm-hmm. the highest fiduciary level, let's say go back to my example of they find out there's a million and a half sitting in Bitcoin. And the, the corpus of their retirement assets are the same amount, million and a half. That could theoretically take them from a 70-30 allocation and the advisor say, okay, we're going to move you down to 50-50 or 40-70 yeah. because of what you're holding out there. But, but so, that's giving advice into itself too. And then you still have to watch Bitcoin. And then it's it really yeah. creates a conundrum for advisors. And that's why we, we, we really want that carve out to say, you know, while we will take into consideration the risk that you and the allocation you have, we're not managing that over there. And, and it could be anything. It doesn't necessarily need to be Bitcoin. It could be Tesla stock or, you know, it can be Apple. It could be anything. Um, you know, if they're not managing it, uh, you know, and there's a, a price drop, a drop there, then who's responsible? Mm-hmm. Right. So it needs to be clear what the advisor is doing. And think of it from the fiduciary duty that we were talking about before. It's um, the, the the definition of your fiduciary duty cuts both ways. So the things that you're not doing, it's important to state what you're not doing as well as a fiduciary so that there's no misconception as to what an advisor is doing for them and what they're not doing and how they're earning their money. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot there. And we think that, you know, the most important aspect is, you know, is, is making sure that if something is out of a very standard norm, that there's something in writing that helps the everybody demonstrate what they were thinking, because everyone's going to draw their own conclusions, you know, two months, two years, five years down the road as to what someone might have been thinking, you know, back in, in March 2020. Yep. Yep. All right. We could do multiple shows just on that. Let's move on to the, another priority is around compliance programs. What, what's the SEC thinking as it relates to that this year? Oh, excellent. My, you know, my, my favorite topic, you know, so we spend a lot of time not only designing and building the compliance programs, but helping make sure that they are, uh, that they remain current to how the advisor actually conducts his business. So uh, they, they, they listed a number of things they want to make sure that are actually in a compliance program. And uh, again, I use the term kind of backdoor regulation here. Notice you see some of these same things listed the, the, uh, in, in the communication I sent, business continuity plans, compliance resources, sustainable investing, 
outside affiliations like broker dealers, your portfolio management, safekeeping of client assets. So they're hitting a lot of the topics that some have extra definitions, some don't, but it's all intentional to be able to say, look, all of these things are important to have a risk management program. And as a fiduciary, you're responsible to be thinking of all these and have mitigation uh, and risk techniques here. And your CCO is responsible for not only developing this compliance program, but testing its effectiveness on a regular basis, at least annually going forward. So what the SEC is looking for is, to, as I mentioned, business continuity. Did you update your BCP plan to show how you're actually now working in a pandemic? Um, you know, you start to uh, get, go down the path of, uh, uh, of some of the sustainable investing and you have a model portfolio. Does your compliance policies address how you deal with hypothetical performance and the accuracy of the data and the review of advertisements that go out? Um, you know, you have a broker dealer affiliation where you're a registered rep. Where does your where does the policies and procedures of the advisor end and the broker dealer policies pick up? So they're looking for, you know, no one pointing fingers saying, oh, it's that's, you know, outside of our scope or, you know, policies that are either too granular that they can't live up to them or too broad that they don't really say anything is is, is kind of the core of what the SEC is looking to ensure is addressed. Excellent. And the last priority, Chris, and this has been a big issue in my network, are th items around private fund advisors. What are they looking for? Well, you know, they're looking for a number of things out there. So with private fund advisors, this has been a, you know, a hot topic since 2005 and before. But, you know, 2005, where they first tried to create a, a registration of every you know, hedge fund as an advisor. Uh, the, the challenge with a lot of private investments is they're taking numerous forms. So what is that, you know, is, is something a, uh, a perpetual offering by the advisor or is there co-investing between advisor and client? What constitutes a, uh, you know, a, an actual vehicle versus something that was just a legal entity to facilitate the, you know, the means to an end. So there's so much that's baked into this, but, what the, the, what the key thing that they were noting is that um, a strong percentage, uh, better than a third of the advisors out there, have some clients with investments in private investments. And that could be private equity. It could be other hedge funds, fund of funds, uh, SPACs, and you know, other special purpose vehicles and things that are out there. And what they're looking for is across the board. So it's, a, it's is it appropriate back to suit client suitability? Is the advisor sponsoring or offering up a security? And if so, is, is all of the offering of that meeting all of the Securities Act requirements that are out there? Um, is, is it suitable for everybody? So the uh, qualified client and accredited investor definitions have, you know, had some attention over the years. So uh, does it represent, a, you know, a, an excessive uh, proportion of uh, an a client's uh, portfolio. Uh, so it's really all of those risk factors. Uh, but then what most important, we were talking about due diligence and the, the, the oversight of outside products, outside managers, the accessibility of information. So uh, it's one thing to, you know, to monitor what's going on with Apple stock and, you, you know, every, you know, across the Internet, every financial news, uh, you know, site and station will give information on that. In a private investment, how do we get information? And what's the timeliness of that, that information? How do we get pricing and valuation information? And how do we know that it's accurate? And is it timely? So if the firm only gives you semi-annual uh, if the vehicle was only creating semi-annual pricing and you have it in a portfolio and you, and you bill, uh, and you bill on your portfolio, uh, and you build a client account on a monthly basis, well, what, what valuation are you using for five out of the six months where it's technically incorrect? Right. right. So th those things are the areas where they're trying to dig into and, 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 um, more room, I think more rulemaking will come out of that. But this is where they're they're likely to do some sweep exams, and uh, they're continuing to ask probing questions, and they're uh, perusing through ADV data 
to look for to look to look for you know areas that they have to focus on. Excellent. Chris, I got to tell you, you make compliance interesting and you have a great way of explaining things that even someone like myself can understand. For podcast listeners to learn, learn more about Chris and Advisor Assist, please visit advisorassist.com. That's advisorassist.com. And Chris, I really appreciate you coming on right here in the middle of your busy season. Oh, thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. 